mom and to see her sister after being gone for so long. Let's write down really quickly at level one. Pay attention to the exchanges now that will happen between the three of them, all right? And as well, a fourth, a man who we're about to meet, but we're not going to hear a lot about him. Let's pay attention. Hair is all over his head, a foot long, and hanging from his chin like a kinky mule tail. I hear Maggie suck in her breath. Ah, uh, is what it sounds like. Like when you see the wriggling end of a snake just in front of your foot on the road. Uh, D next, a dress down to the ground. In this hot weather, a dress so loud it hurts my eyes. There are yellows and oranges enough to throw back the light of the sun. I feel my whole face warming from the heat waves it throws out. Earrings gold too, and hanging down to her shoulders. Bracelets dangling and making noises when she moves her arm up to shake the folds of the dress out of her armpits. The dress is loose and flows, and as she walks closer, I like it. I hear Maggie go, ah, again. It is her sister's hair. It stands straight up like the wool on a sheep. It is black as night, and around the edges are two long pigtails that rope about like small lizards disappearing behind her ears. Top of 1316. Wazu Sotino, she says, coming on in that gliding way the dress makes her move. The short, stocky fellow with the hair to his navel is all grinning, and he follows up with, Salam alaikum, my mother and sister. He moves to hug Maggie, but she falls back right up against the back of my chair. I feel her trembling there, and when I look up, I see the perspiration falling off her chin. Now for a moment, let's just pause. The descriptions of the two as they get out of the, uh, out of the car. Let's say three things really quickly at level one for your notes. One, both of them have a very foreign look about them, very different from mom and Maggie living in the country. Uh, two, we're also going to see that the dress of D is very colorful. And we're finally, number three, going to see that both of these characters are going to be embracing the new movement of the late 20th century when you are going to have large numbers of black um, African Americans who would begin to embrace their African heritage and even the Islamic heritage following in, uh, for example, Malcolm X. So you've got different kinds of greetings, one an African greeting, one an Islamic greeting. What Walker is doing here is she's pointing out and even critiquing, and she took some heat for this, that sometimes people can claim that they believe in a heritage they don't really understand very well at all. But in the claiming of one heritage, they may actually try and distance themselves from another heritage. Finally, how does Maggie act? when Dee shows up in this beautiful dress. This, hmm, right? That kind of, note the irony as well. Did you see this at level 2B? We can just point this out. Note the irony at the bottom of 1315. Mama says, I feel my whole face warming from the heat waves that this dress throws out. It's an interesting irony. Uh, it can be read ironic or it can be read literally. All right, here we go. The exchange now between the two. Maggie wants to run away. Mama's not going to let Maggie run away. All right, here we go. Don't get up, says Dee. Since I am stout, it takes something of a push. You can see me trying to move a second or two before I make it. She turns, showing white heels through her sandals, and goes back to the car. Out she peeks next with a Polaroid. A camera. She stoops down quickly and lines up picture after picture of me sitting there in front of the house with Maggie cowering behind me. She never takes a shot without making sure the house is included. When a cow comes nibbling around the edge of the yard, she snaps it and me and Maggie and the house. Then she puts the Polaroid in the back seat of the car and comes up and kisses me on the forehead. Meanwhile, Salam Alaikum is going through motions with Maggie's hand. Maggie's hand is as limp as a fish and probably as cold despite the sweat and she keeps trying to pull it back. It looks like Salam Alaikum wants to shake hands but wants to do it fancy. 
or maybe he don't know how people shake hands. Anyhow, he soon gives up on Maggie. Well, I say, D. No, Mama, she says, not D. Wanjiro Liwanika Kimanjo. What happened to D? I wanted to know. She's dead, Wanjiro said. I couldn't bear it any longer, being named after the people who oppress me. You know as well as me you was named after your Aunt Deesey, I said. Deesey is my sister. She named D. We called her Big D after D was born. But who was she named after? asked Wanjiro. I guess after Grandma D, I said. And who was she named after? asked Wanjiro. Her mother, I said, and saw Wanjiro was getting tired. That's about as far back as I can trace it, I said. Though, in fact, I probably could have carried it back beyond the Civil War through the branches. Well, said Salama Alaikum, there you are. Um, I heard Maggie say. There I was not, I said, before DC cropped up in our family. So why should I try to trace it that far back? He just stood there grinning, looking down on me like somebody inspecting a Model A car. Every once in a while, he and Wanjiro sent eye signals over my head. How do you pronounce this name? I asked. You don't have to call me by it if you don't want to, said Wanjiro. Why shouldn't I? I asked. If that's what you want us to call you, we'll call you. I know it might sound awkward at first, said Wanjiro. I'll get used to it, I said. Ream it out again. Well. Well, we'll pause for a moment now. Sometimes readers of the story don't fully grasp what's going on here. You have Dee and her guy who are arriving, and they, two things. One, they want to take photographs of the house. It's like somehow they want to document this extreme poverty from which Dee used to grow. Well, she grew up out of this poverty, right? The second thing is this thing about the naming. What's going on with the naming? Let's, let's outline this really quickly at level one, what's going on. The naming, of course, here, and the changing of the name has everything to do with wanting to somehow distance oneself from the oppressive experiences of slave culture in the South. And so the, and so the name change is going to be for D and her guy easily explainable as we don't want to have any more to do with this kind of associations with the Deep South and with, and with slavery. Mom, on the other hand, has no understanding of what's going on, but she's bright enough to understand that back and forth D and her man are talking with signals and eye signals over her head. Mama's a way, way sharper than both D as well as this, uh, this man with D give her credit, we might say. But there's something obviously going on here. Let's write it down in regards to the questions of heritage, where you come from. Let's jump to 3B for just a moment and write this question down. Have you ever been ashamed of your mom and dad? Have you ever been ashamed of the house you were living in? I once had a junior student that said, I totally understood this happening to me in middle school because I did not realize that I came from poverty until the kids started making fun of me. The clothes I wore, the crappy truck that my dad dropped me off in middle school in, that kind of thing. And the kids made fun of me and then I started to feel self-conscious about it. So that's kind of where we're the game that we're playing. Dee is going to try to keep Maggie in her place, Mama in her place, only Mama's got a surprise for Dee. Now let's keep reading uh, and to see where this conflict is going to evolve. Soon we got the name out of the way. Salam Alaikum had a name twice as long and three times as hard. After I tripped over it two or three times, he told me just to call him Hakim Ababar. I wanted to ask him, was he a barber? But I didn't really think he was, so I didn't ask. You must belong to those beef cattle people down the road, I said. They said salam alaikum when they met you too, but they didn't shake hands. Always too busy, 
feeding the cattle, fixing the fences, putting up salt lick shelters, throwing down hay. When the white folks poisoned some of the herd, the men stayed up all night with rifles in their hands. I walked a mile and a half just to see the sight. Hakima Barber said, I accept some of their doctrines, but farming and raising cattle is not my style. They didn't tell me, and I didn't ask, whether Wanjiro, D, had really gone and married him. We sat down to eat, and right away he said he didn't eat collards, and pork was unclean. Wanjiro, though, went on through the chitlins and cornbread, the greens, and everything else. She talked a blue streak over the sweet potatoes. Everything delighted her. Even the fact that we still used the benches her daddy made for the table when we couldn't afford to buy chairs. Oh, mama, she cried, then turned to Hakima Barber. I never knew how lovely these benches are. You can feel the rump prints, she said, running her hands underneath her and along the bench. Then she gave a sigh and her hand closed over Grandma D's butter dish. That's it, she said. I knew there was something I wanted to ask you if I could have. She jumped up from the table and went over in the corner where the churn stood. The milk in it clabbered by now. She looked at the churn top and Top of 1318. This churn top is what I need, she said. Didn't Uncle Buddy whittle it out of a tree you all used to have? Yes, I said. Uh-huh, she said happily, and I want the dasher too. Uncle Buddy whittled that too, asked the barber. D. Wanjiro looked up at me. Aunt D's first husband whittled the dash, said Maggie so low you almost couldn't hear her. His name was Henry, but they called him Stash. Maggie's brain is like an elephant's, Wanjiro said, laughing. I can use the churn top as a centerpiece for the alcove table, she said, sliding a plate over the churn. And I'll think of something artistic to do with the dasher. When she finished wrapping the dasher, the handle stuck out. I took it for a moment in my hands. You didn't even have to look close to see where hands pushing the dasher up and down to make butter had left a kind of sink in the wood. In fact, there were a lot of small sinks. You could see where thumbs and fingers had sunk into the wood. It was beautiful light yellow wood from a tree that grew in the yard where Big D and Stash had lived. After dinner, D, Wanjiro, went to the trunk at the foot of my bed and started rifling through it. Maggie hung back in the kitchen over the dishpan. Out came Wanjiro with two quilts. They had been pieced by Grandma D, and then Big D and me had hung them on the quilt frames on the front porch and quilted them. One was in the lone star pattern. The other was walk around the mountain. In both of them were scraps of dresses Grandma D had worn 50 and more years ago, bits and pieces of Grandpa Jarrell's paisley shirts and one teeny faded blue piece about the size of a penny matchbox that was from great grandpa Ezra's uniform that he wore in the Civil War. Mama, Wanjiro said, sweet as a bird, can I have these old quilts? I heard something fall in the kitchen and a minute later the kitchen door slammed. Why don't you take one or two of the others, I asked. These old things was just done by me and Big D from some tops your grandma pieced before she died. No, said Wanjiro. I don't want those. They are stitched around the borders by machine. That'll make them last better, I said. That's not the point, said Wanjiro. These are all pieces of dresses grandma used to wear. She did all this stitching by hand. Imagine. She held the quilts securely in her arms, stroking them. Some of the pieces, like those lavender ones, come from old clothes her mother handed down to her, I said, moving up to touch the quilts. D, Wanjiro, moved back just enough so that I couldn't reach the quilts. They already belonged to her. 
Imagine, she breathed again, clutching them closely to her bosom. The truth is, I said, I promise to give them quilts to Maggie for when she marries John Thomas. She gasped like a bee had stung her. Maggie can't appreciate these quilts, she said. She'd probably be backward enough to put them to everyday use. I reckon she would, I said. God knows I've been saving them for long enough with nobody using them. I hope she will. I didn't want to bring up how I had offered Dee, one Jiro, a quilt when she went away to college. Then she had told me they were old-fashioned, out of style. But they're priceless, she was saying now furiously, for she has a temper. Maggie would put them on the bed and in five years they'd be in rags, less than that. She can always make some more, I said. Maggie knows how to quilt. D, one Jiro, looked at me with hatred. You just will not understand. The point is these quilts, these quilts. Well, I said, stumped, what would you do with them? Hang them, she said, as if that was the only thing you could do with quilts. Maggie by now was standing in the door. I could almost hear the sound her feet made as they scraped over each other. She can have them, Mama, she said, like somebody used to never winning anything or having anything reserved for her. I can remember Grandma D without the quilts. I looked at her hard. She had filled her bottom lip with checkerberry snuff and it gave her face a kind of dopey hang dog look. It was Grandma D and Big D who taught her how to quilt herself. She stood there with her scarred hands hidden in the folds of her skirt. She looked at her sister with something like fear, but she wasn't mad at her. This was Maggie's portion. This was the way she knew God to work. When I looked at her like that, something hit me in the top of my head and ran down to the soles of my feet. Just like when I'm in church and the Spirit of God touches me and I get happy and shout. Top of 1320. I did something I never had done before. Hugged Maggie to me, then dragged her on into the room. Snatched the quilts out of Miss Wanjiro's hands and dumped them into Maggie's lap. Maggie just sat there on my bed with her mouth open. Take one or two of the others, I said to Dee. But she turned without a word and went out to Hakim a barber. You just don't understand, she said, as Maggie and I came out to the car. What don't I understand? I wanted to know. Your heritage, she said. And then she turned to Maggie, kissed her and said, you ought to try to make something of yourself too, Maggie. It's really a new day for us. But from the way you and Mama still live, you'd never know it. She put on some sunglasses that hid everything above the tip of her nose and her chin. Maggie smiled, maybe at the sunglasses, but a real smile, not scared. After we watched the car dust settle, I asked Maggie to bring me a dip of snuff, and then the two of us sat there just enjoying until it was time to go in the house and go to bed. Now, I love to teach this story because of the genius of Alice Walker. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, we're capable of really appreciating in a short story all of the things that Walker is pulling off. Now, let's go ahead and work through our three levels of reading, just starting at level one here to make sure we've got a summary of the story. This is a story that when we summarize it is unbelievably simple, so let's do it at level one. This is a story about an, a, an older sister who comes back home to her very poor mother and sister, Maggie, and Dee is very quick to make sure that she lets everyone know why she's home. Why is she home? What? She wants some part of her old life that she can take with her. Notice, first it's going to be this butter churn, and you got a picture of it, by the way, on your book, don't you, on the, uh, 1318, right? She wants, an old, she wants an old butter churn. Now, she's not going to use it, obviously, to churn butter. She's just going to use it for decoration. But then she finds two quilts. The quilts, of course, are very old, 
and they're being, they're being stored for Maggie's use later, but she declares that she wants these quilts. Now, why does she want these quilts? Again, she wants to be able to show part of her heritage. She wants to use them as decoration. She, of course, becomes really outraged when mom says, no, these are for Maggie. Her comment, of course, is that Maggie will put the quilts to everyday use, obviously the title of our story. When she's refused, notice how Dee responds. She gets angry, and then she leaves, but before she leaves, she wants to pass on a sermon to her mother and to her sister about learning to know your heritage and, of course, finding some way to be successful, make something of yourself. Did you see that little word, too, also? In other words, she's able to give the insult to Maggie, isn't she? In other words, you're a looser, but you could become successful just like me. And then she drives away. Well, that's the story at level one. But what's brilliant, of course, about this story every day is, is that when you start working at level two and three, this is a powerfully complicated story. Let's go ahead and jump to it really quickly at 2A. We got major messages and themes going on here. Let's list several of them, shall we? One, there obviously is the whole dynamic about what goes on between sisters. D has always been the fortunate one. Maggie has always been, what would we say, the unfortunate one. Maggie scarred in a fire, Maggie uneducated. All Maggie knows how to do is quilt. Dee, on the other hand, has gone away, gotten educated, learned, of course, about her roots back to Africa, and she now is going to arrive and she's going to educate her sister and her mother. Okay? But there's a tension here between the two sisters because D has always